From the heartland of America to every nation on earth, this is Jack Van Empe Presents The Truth in News and Commentary. Here now are doctors Jack and Rexella Van Empe. Jack and Impey presents. Whoa, do we have some news to give you right now that is global. And I tell you, Jack does so much studying to keep these programs going. I've never seen anything like it. The first headline, Will the World End May 21st, 2011? This May. He's got some good news, so stay tuned. And the end of the church age and after... Well, you know, friends, two weeks ago, Jack said that he would be addressing some statements propagated by Harold Camping. You must see what he's talking about here. The end of the church age and after. Take a look at this, please. This is what he's saying. The church age has come to an end. The consequence of the end of the church age is that God no longer uses local congregations to evangelize the world. In fact, the Holy Spirit will no longer save anyone in a local congregation. Moreover, since God has abandoned the local congregations, Satan, as the man of sin, looking like an angel of light, rules in each and every local congregation. Consequently, true believers are commanded to come out. Now, I tell you. Total air. Harold Camping, I just don't know where you get your information, but Jack is going to address this fully. Are we at an end of the church age, Jack? Absolutely not. And he's gone so far as to say you should not go to any church. You stay home, read your Bible. You don't get baptized or take communion. That's all passe. The church age is finished. Not so. The Lord Jesus said to the apostle Peter, whom do men say that I am? And he said, they say you are Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And he said, Peter, upon this statement about me, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, that doesn't sound like your message. Jesus said, nothing's going to stop it. And my Bible says in Ephesians 1, and 23, that the church is the body of Christ. You think he's corrupt? Not only that, but when we get to 1 Peter 3.15, it talks about the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Not what you say that is satanically controlled. Now, what about baptism? Is that passe and then communion? Let's see. Jesus said in Matthew 20.19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things which I have taught you, even about baptism, even unto the end of the age before I come for the millennium. And don't take the communion. That's passe. Shame on you. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. Paul says, I have received of the Lord Jesus that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And break it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. When you take it, do it in remembrance of me. The crucifixion. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes again. Don't tell me we shouldn't be using baptism or the Lord's Supper today. You're totally in error. Mm, very well said, Jack, and totally from the Bible. We don't want to look at his book for advice 
or for guidance, we want to look at the Bible. Everybody has an opinion. I've said it so often. Well, again, I want you to notice something here on Camping's book. I have something to say about the time element of mankind. <clears throat> here you see it. Adam, when? A biblical solution to the time a table of mankind. And then going on, a chronological record of events according to the Holy Bible, biblical calendar of history. Again, a chronological record of events according to the Holy Bible, and there you see it. And it is the creation of Adam, underlined. Look at that date. Yeah, 11,013. Nonsense. You see, I never saw that in my whole life before. And then the flood, take a look, 4990 to 4989 B.C. And did you notice something? He started that out, a chronological record of events according to the Holy Bible. I'm sorry, that's not what I get from the Bible, is it, Jack? Would you please like to explain creation of Adam and the flood, please? He says that Adam and Eve were created in 11,013 and that the flood began in 4990. That is totally wrong. I have studied 100,000 hours in the Bible. If you were to sit down today and do 24-hour days, there'd be 11 years without stopping. I have read 12,000 volumes. Half of them are in Bible prophecy. I have never read a theologian who believed that Adam and Eve were created in 11,013. But I'll tell you what the Bible does teach, and that's this. First of all, the rabbis taught the six-day theory. And they said, this means that our world was created in six days, and that's Genesis 1, 31 and then we rested on the Shabbat Sabbath, the seventh day, Genesis 2, 2. So that means there'll be 6,000 years of history and then our Messiah will come. Now, on what did they base that? Psalm 90, verse 4, a thousand years is like a day. All right? The Christians also taught the same in 2 Peter 3, 8, knowing this verse that there shall come scoffers, saying, oh, where is the promise of his coming? And he said, I'll tell you when it's going to be. Verse 8, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. They also said he created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And so the world will go on 6,000 years and then our Lord will come. Now listen very carefully. We have just recently passed the 6,000 mark. This is the Bible. This is actual. This is right. You say, how do you know that? First, the rabbis, great scholars. They said, I'm talking about Rabbi Akiba, Rabbi Bekai, Rabbi Elias, Rabbi Eliezer, and Rabbi Jose, that it would start with the creation of Adam and Eve, not in 11,013. There's nothing like that I've ever read from any scholar, but it would be the beginning of the first 1,000 years. Who else said it? The church fathers. In the first 100 years of Christianity, we had St. Barnabas and St. Bartholomew. In the second 100 years, we had St. Arrhenius and St. Justin Martyr. In the third 100 years, we had St. Lactinius and St. Methodius all saying that it started with Adam and Eve, just like the rabbis, and it was not 11,013. I'll say that repeatedly because that's the biggest error I've ever heard of in my life. And... Adam and Eve was the beginning, the first day of that new creation, the first 1,000 years. So we're now at 6,000 years, and our Lord and their Messiah could come at any moment. And by the way, Eliezer Shulman in the Jerusalem Post said, our Jewish calendar is 240 years short of the 6,000. And then he discovered why an error in the numberings of the Bible, and he says it comes out to 6,000 years with my correction, and it's right. Not only that, but the great scholar, Himberman, made a chart starting with Adam, and every generation is listed, and when it comes up to Christ, only 4,000 years has passed from Christ till now has made us that we have passed the 6,000 year mark. This is what the Bible teaches, and Usher was right. This man camping puts him down, and so was Larkin in his dispensational charts. Every book, five, six thousand of them I've read by great prophecy scholars all teach what I've just taught. I've never heard this other nonsense before.
Well, Jack, I've never heard of it either, and we need to be very, very careful, friends, who we listen to. Now, let me just point something out here. Harold Camping wrote a book entitled 1994. Take a look at what he states. It's a summary critique in his book, 1994. Harold Camping states the end of the world may occur this year somewhere between September 15th through the 17th, and that's 1994. My word, you can't have uh, a date set like that. It's way past that date, Jack. This book says if a prophecy fails, don't listen to the man anymore. But why did he say between those days? Because he went on to quote Matthew 24, 36, of that day and hour knows no man. Now, there are a lot of Christians using that today. Oh, nobody knows it could be another thousand years. No, it can't because we've passed that 6,000 mark. It has to be near. Now, take that text again. No one knows the day and the hour. Right. But take it in context. Verse 33. You'll know when it's near even at the door. Who said so? Jesus. When I see someone coming up the walk, I know within seconds I will hear the knock. That's how near it is. But we will not know the day and the hour. But how come... Mr. Camping changed it to exactly May 21st of 2011. Where do you finally get this kind of insight? Maybe since the corrupt church ended, huh? Oh, Rick Sella? Yes, yes. Listen to me. May 21st is actually three different days. Do you know that you cannot know the hour? And Christ created this world, Colossians 1.16, so he pretty well knew about all of these different continents and the oceanography and the rest. Every hour of the day is represented somewhere in the world. So if he comes at a certain hour, it's 23 different hours in other parts of the world. Now, for instance, we're in Detroit, Michigan. Los Angeles, it's... 7 in the evening. We come on through that station at 10 in the evening in Detroit. All right. Now, that is still the 21st of May, for instance. But my relatives in Belgium are six hours ahead of that. Israel's seven hours ahead, and it's already the 22nd there. So you got two days. Let's continue. When you get to China, you have 13 hours ahead. New Zealand, 16 hours ahead, and Australia, 18 hours ahead. But we're still just talking about two days now, but they're actually three days at one time. So nobody can know the day and the hour, and Christ knew that because he was the creator of this world, uh, John 1, 3. Oh, Jack. Oh, Jack. That is so very, very interesting. And I want to put something on the screen right now, and it is worldtimeserver.com, proving everything that you've been talking about, all the times in the world. Well, you know, I'm a Detroit boy, so look to the right, the far right at the top, and that is Detroit, Michigan, USA. Now, I'm using this first because it is the 21st of May, 2011, where he says the world's going to end. Now, in Detroit, that would be 5.30 a.m. But now go back to the left at the top. In American Samoa, it would be 11.30 p.m. the day before, Friday, May 20th. Now, down below that, Iceland would be 10.30 a.m. Saturday, May 21st, like Michigan. But then, the Line Islands would be at 12.30 a.m., and that would be Sunday, May 22nd, 2011. You have three days simultaneous. Now, there are two groups wrong. Mr. Camping is wrong. But he should have stuck to no one knows the day and the hour, but he didn't. But to those who use that to say it's a thousand years from now, wrong. We've got the six-day theory, and after 6,000 years, all these great scholars among the rabbis and the church fathers all said it would be after 6,000 years, starting with the countdown at Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. Well, he has gone a step farther. Mr. Camping has also given us quite a date. Look at the date he's given. The end of the world is almost here. Holy God will bring judgment day on May 21st, 2011. And then going on, we are almost there with no apologies. It's the intent of this book to warn as many people as possible about the abundant, uh-oh, 
biblical evidence that the end of the world is almost here. I'm sorry. Biblical evidence? Oh, Jack, you're going to uh, really I am kind of going to prove that the world will never end. That's the greatest error that's ever been taught in Christian circles based on Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 39. The end of the world. Verse 40. The end of the world. Verse 49. Same thing. Matthew 24, 3. Matthew 28, 19. Hebrews 9, 26. Six times the Bible talks about the end of the world. If you're a Greek scholar and the New Testament was written in Greek, you know that the term there from the Greek is not world, it's age. There are seven different ages. And the fifth age was the law and Moses. The sixth age was grace and Christ. That's all Matthew 1, 17. And the seventh age is when Christ comes to set up his glorious kingdom. And so that is a misinterpretation. Now, will you take those six verses and say that's the end of the world? Or will you take 120 that I have memorized in my head that say the world will never end? For instance, Ecclesiastes 1.4, the earth abides forever. Hey, how long is forever? It's forever. Psalm 104 verse 5, Yahweh God laid the foundation of the earth that shall never, never be removed, never be destroyed. And then we get to Matthew 5, 5. Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. Not heaven, the earth. This is where we're going to live in the future because it's not destroyed. And the meek and the righteous inherit the earth forever and forever. Psalm 37, 29. That's why Isaiah 45, 17 and Ephesians 3, 21 both say it's a world without end. And that's why every Catholic mass ends with world without end. Amen and amen. Now, it has to be that the earth will never be destroyed because he's going to come back and set his kingdom up here. Now, there's going to be a horrible war during the tribulation hour. And Russia and China and all these nations march, Ezekiel 38 and 39. And... Uh, Revelation 16, 12, and chapter 9, verses 14 to 18. It's going to be terrible. And so there'll be great destruction, but not the end of the world. When Christ comes back in Matthew 25, 31, the angels come with him, and he sits upon the throne of his father David in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's still there, and there are three billion still left on earth. So they didn't all get destroyed. It is not judgment day. Now Christ comes back, and now watch Matthew 24, 3. What should be the coming and the sign of the end of the world? Can't be. Why? It has to be the end of the age of grace because when you turn the page, he has come back to earth to set up his kingdom and says in verse 31 to the saved, come and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We're going to see that that kingdom is on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The prayer we all pray. Matthew. Now listen very carefully again. Well, what about these texts that talk about all the devastation? There are two words in the Greek. Neos and Kainos. Neos means a brand new creation. That's not what's going to happen. He comes back and though we've been through a war, it's Kainos. A remodeling job. A restoration. A renewal. Let me prove this. When Christ comes back, he says in Matthew 19, 28, that it will be a time of regeneration. And Acts 3, 21, Luke said it would be the restitution of all things. Now, I beg you to do this. Look in Webster's Dictionary for regeneration and restitution. Both mean a remodeling job, a renewal. And thank God, even the Catholic Catechism says the same thing. It's going to be renewed. So the world will never end. Well, what about 2 Peter 3.10 about the heavens passing away? Well, you have to have everything in the Word of God. It means the heavens shall be changed. Hebrews 1.12. There's going to be no end of the world. Sleep well. All right, Jack. Remember at the beginning of the program, I said that we were going to give you good news, and I'm going to give it to you right now along with what Jack just said. It has to do with the cover of Christianity today. Whoa, there it is. Praying thy kingdom come. 
How true. And God's kingdom is a real government. It's not abstract. It's a real government. Now, there has to be a world here in order for God to bring his kingdom here. Now, this is good news, isn't it? The world is not going to end. It's not going to end, Jack. If Christ is coming to set up his kingdom, the world has to be here, like Rex Ellis said. And we see him coming royally, majestically, in Revelation 19, 11. And as he comes, the armies in heaven follow him. Verse 14, that's the saints who are raptured, returning with Christ to rule with him in that kingdom. And that is, of course, when he comes as the king of kings and lord of lords, the king of the kings. There's a government there. And lord of the lords, verse 16. To rule and reign for 1,000 years, Revelation 20, verse 4, okay? Now, wait a minute. That's only 1,000 years. Then he is recommissioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 28. And Revelation 11, 15 says, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever and forever. Not just a thousand years. Oh, is this exciting? We believers shall rule and reign with him 1,000 years. As already said, Revelation 20, verse 4. But in Revelation 22, 5, we reign with him forever and forever and forever. Here on earth, it can never be destroyed. It's never going to end. That's a misinterpretation of the six verses I gave you earlier. And Isaiah 9, 6 says, Unto us a child is born, virgin birth. Unto us a son is given. That's when he comes as the king and the government shall be upon his shoulder and of his government and peace there shall be no end. And oh, Rexella, I love this. The angel Gabriel appears to the Virgin Mary and he says, your son Jesus shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest and he shall sit upon the throne of his father David in Jerusalem and he shall reign over the house of Israel forever and forever, and forever, and forever, and I could keep on saying forever because that's how long it's going to be. That new kingdom, eternally on earth. Sleep well, the world's not going to end. All right, we know the world is not going to end, but, you know, the Lord could come back at any time. We don't know the day or the hour, but He's coming back, not to destroy the world. But, you know, friends, I just want to impress you with something. Everyone is valuable to God. You are valuable to God. He loves you. He died for you. He wants to be your Savior. Oh, Jack, we need to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, mm -hmm. no matter when it might be. And God has made it so simple. His Son paid the price. It cost you nothing. It's a free gift, Romans 6, 23. Just call on Him. Be saved. Look at me. Pray this, Lord Jesus, Savior of the world, the only Savior. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying, suffering, agonizing. As you shed that blood for me to cleanse and save me. Now, Jesus, today I take you into my heart as my own Savior. I want to be ready for your return. We'll be together forever here on earth soon. Jesus, save me. Amen. Amen. I trust you prayed that prayer and you're ready for the coming of the Lord. Please write to me. There is my address and I will be happy to send you this little booklet, First Steps in a New Direction. You want to go in a different direction? You want to leave behind all the stuff you're in right now? The Lord will walk to you. Write to me. Well, you know, we have a wonderful offer for you. Bob, would you please tell them how they can receive it? To order your copy of the book, God's Good Plan, with the bonus DVD, Terrorism Accelerating But Peace Coming, have your credit card ready and call toll-free 24 hours a day, 1-800-JVI-7777. To order by mail in the U.S., send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries, Box 7004, Troy, Michigan, 48007. In Canada, send your donation of $24.95 to Jack Van Impey Ministries of Canada, Box 1717, Postal Station A, Windsor, Ontario, 
N9A6Y1. Thank you so much, Bob. Please order God's Good Plan because we are also going to be enclosing in an extended DVD that you will want because we are giving more information. And I want to leave you with a very, very good thought. I love coming in your home, by the way, every week. It brings joy to our hearts. You know what, friends? To know the Bible is good, but to know its author is better. How true. You need to know the Lord, the one who wrote and inscribed the Bible for us to know everything that's coming. Look forward to being your home again next week. And until then, remember, God cares for you. So do we. So very much. Bye-bye.